It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Great Hall of the City College of New York. Um, I know there are many of you that have maybe never been here before or you're here for the first time uh, in many years in this, in this room. I'd like to just invite you to take a second and, and look around this room. It's not an accident that Shepherd Hall and the Great Hall were designed to mimic a Gothic cathedral. Uh, it was designed as an indication of the sacredness of public education. It's no accident that the stained glass windows around you all represent the great educational institutions that existed when CCNY first built this building in 1907. They were donated as a token of the general affirmation of the mission of City College. And it's no accident that if you look at this um, original fresco in the back wall, you'll notice that the students graduating under the eyes of Beethoven and Sigmund Freud and others, some of them wear overalls and some of them are carrying a hammer and some of them are in military uniform because this is the place where we first in America decided that education, higher education, college education was for the whole people. It was for people who had talent and drive and ambition even if they didn't have great parentage and even if they didn't have a great deal of money. Um, and we continue that tradition today. Um, we, along with uh, six other CUNY schools, represent the, uh, six or seven of the top most successful schools in the country in producing social mobility in our graduates. And so from the windows to the architecture to the paintings to our accomplishments, um, we are the place for social mobility and in higher education. And I just can't. I can't open a talk in this room without in, in some ways invoking that legacy and taking a moment to, to, to call forth the sense of place that we have here. I came to City College in 1991 as an assistant professor and I joined the department from which uh, Stanley Feingold had recently uh, retired. And in that department every spring, there was always a day when the conference room was unavailable to us. And it was unavailable because Stanley Feingold um, and his uh, collaborator in our department, George McKenna, were debating what would be in their latest textbook. They had a series of textbooks in which the left and the right engaged in debates over whatever the, the, the issues of the day were. And they would fight over what to include and what not to include and how they would frame these arguments. And if you weren't careful, they would pull you in and your day would be shot. Stanley represents, uh, and Anita, I'm not going to step on your lines. Anita Altman is going to come up and talk a little bit more about Stanley. I'd like to talk about the tradition that Stanley embodies at this campus. If you go downstairs to the basement of this building, you'll find some archways that used to be called the alcoves. Some of you probably hung out in the alcoves. And through much of the 20th century, the different alcoves held the different groups on campus, the democratic socialists, the socialists, the Marxists, the neo-Marxists, the quasi-neo-Marxists, mostly to the left of the political spectrum. And that's where they would gather to argue and debate. And it was out of that tradition, the tradition more indigenous to this campus than probably any other institution in the United States, that the idea of argument and challenge and debate as a primary vehicle of education, um, came to embody the mission of this place. Because we've always been a place that looked to working people, to the underclass, to people who for other reasons were excluded from other institutions, then we always had a full store of students and faculty who objected to the status quo. And they made those objections felt in the alcoves, in the classrooms, and after they graduated, in the streets and buildings and institutions of this city and beyond. And Stanley Feingold embodied that. 
when I was teaching political science, I sometimes taught methodology. And, and what I would say to my students is, you know, ask them, how do you assess the, the strength of an argument? And after they puzzled over it a little bit, I'd say, well, how do you test whether you want to buy a watermelon? And eventually, we'd come around to the idea that you knock on it. And if it sounds right, and if it withstands your knocking, maybe provisionally you accept that it might be a good watermelon to buy. And I offered this as an example of what you do in political argument. You find a proposition or an assertion of truth, and you knock on it. And you keep knocking on it until you find a soft spot. And if you've knocked on it long enough, and you don't find a soft spot, provisionally you accept the argument but only provisionally, because we're City College. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm here on behalf of this great institution in this gorgeous room to welcome you to an evening of watermelon knocking on the great tradition of Stanley Feingold and the City College of New York. So I think, Anita, I haven't said anything that you were planning to say, it is my great pleasure to invite to the podium one of the many alumni here who studied under Stanley Feingold and, are, and, and for whose devotion to him this lecture stands. Please welcome to the podium Anita Altman. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I want to I also welcome you here today uh, to this, our second annual Stanley Feingold Memorial Symposium. We're so happy to have Stanley's beloved wife, Fumiko, and his daughter, Karen and Jira, with us as well. They've traveled from across the country and from the south of the country to be with us today. Um, this lecture series was established by a large group of alumni in partnership with City College's Colin Powell School to honor the memory of Stanley, a beloved, gifted professor of political science. Professor Feingold was himself a graduate of City who taught here for almost four decades. For the generations of those of us fortunate to have been his student, he left a lasting, often life-changing mark as expressed in the very many tributes from his former students that followed, uh, that flowed following his death in September of 2017. It's often said if you majored in po political science during his long tenure here, most likely you majored in Stanley Feingold. Professor Feingold was a passionate, dedicated teacher committed to his students. He intellectually challenged us, provoking us with hard, often uncomfortable questions, forcing us to see the other sides of our long-held, one might say, smugly held views. In class, he never revealed his own position. He and Professor George McKenna, as you've heard, who also had a very long career at the college, together published Taking Sides, Clashing Views on Controversial Political Issues, which provided readers with the same opportunity to do the same. His commitment was to develop critical thinkers, a capacity so desperately needed in contemporary America. He was also committed, so committed to this college. When City College was closed down during the student strike in 1968, Stanley opened up his home, which was then located nearby to the school, to continue conducting his classes. Trusted by students and the administration alike, he was called in to help negotiate a resolution to the shutdown. Years later, after he retired, for almost two decades, he traveled from his home in Seattle five times a year to meet with former students, who themselves were now long established in their own fields. And we continued over brown bag lunches, those scintillating, challenging discussions about the current state of the American political landscape. You can only imagine what the fodder of the 2016 election of Trump provided for us. And it was only then, at these lunchtime discussions, that we learned his real political opinions, passionately felt, but for all those years in the classroom, carefully he refrained from sharing them. Moreover, he continued to write, and we were blessed to read his many opinion pieces. 
and over time he wrote a significant body of essays which revealed his humanist progressive perspective that challenged many conventional wisdoms. So finally, on behalf of my fellow student alums, I want to express our profound appreciation for the enthusiastic support of President Boudreau, Didi Mozaleski, the executive director of the Combined Foundations at the college, and Andrew, um, Dean Andrew Rice of the Colin Powell School, who have made it possible for us to honor our beloved teacher with the founding of this annual Stanley Feingold Lecture Series. And of course, we are so grateful both to Congressman Jerry Nadler for giving us his precious time when as chair of the House Judiciary Committee, he is playing a key role in the impeachment process currently before the Congress and the country. And likewise too, to Jeffrey Tubin, esteemed legal analyst for The New Yorker and CNN. My only regret is that Stanley is not here to participate in what I know will be a fascinating session and to receive this honor at this institution he so dearly loved and which he so dearly deserved. Thank you. Wow, what a turnout. Welcome everyone to the second event in the Stanley Feingold Lecture Series. I'll repeat what Anita said, because it's worth repeating. Um, on behalf of all of us who were Stanley students, I want to thank President Boudreau, Dean Rich, D.D. Mozaleski, for making our wish to celebrate Stanley a reality. And thanks to all of you who have contributed so generously to the lecture fund. The topic of today's conversation the rule of law and challenges to our democracy could not be a more compelling subject of discussion at this time in our country's history. We are greatly privileged to have two participants whose prominence in their individual public spheres is unmatched. Jeffrey Tubin, whom I have been privileged to know since the early 1990s when he was a trial attorney in the criminal division of the U.S. Attorney's Office, has been a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine for over 25 years, has authored numerous books, and is the chief legal analyst for CNN. His contributions to the, to the public dialogue on the current impeachment process are unparalleled in their objectivity and, and creativity. And we are very fortunate to have him here this afternoon to speak with Congressman Nadler. Congressman Nadler has been a public servant for over four decades. New York City residents have known Gerald Nadler for years and consistently elected him to represent them, first as a New York State Assemblyman in 1976 and then as their congressman in 1992. Gerald Nadler is also the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. That congressional committee is one of three committees which are at the epicenter of the presidential impeachment investigation. And in the event, inevitable as it appears, that articles of impeachment will be brought, it will be in the Judiciary Committee where they are drawn up. So please join me in welcoming our two guests and watch and listen as news happens in your presence and perhaps under the watchful eye of Professor Feingold. Thank you. Jeffrey. Hello, everyone. Congressman, hello. Hi. All right, one of the, one of the rules of journalism is you, you don't bury the lead. So uh, let's talk about impeachment. Um, let's, let, let's start by just asking, like, what's, what's the procedure? What's going to happen now with the investigation and how it will proceed, in the, at least in the next few weeks? Well, I'm not going to speculate on, on the impeachment, but I can tell you the procedures, what's going to, 
what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Uh, obviously, you know that uh, any reader of any newspaper knows that uh, the Intelligence Committee is conducting hearings on the allegations with respect to, uh, uh, let's call it the, the, the Ukraine matter. And uh, they will finish their, uh, their in, uh, closed hearings soon. I don't know exactly when. Then they'll have some open hearings. They'll write a report. And the question will then go to the Judiciary Committee. And the Judiciary Committee will have to consider the matter from there. Uh, with whatever, however wide or narrow we want to consider it. Um, what's a high crime and misdemeanor? That is a good... Interesting question. That's why and I asked it. I will tell you, I was on the uh, Judiciary Committee. I was a junior member when we had the Clinton impeachment. I, I covered and it. The, yeah. And the first thing I did when, when that came up was to read everything I could get my hands on on what's an impeachable offense, starting with Blackstone. And I found, and there were books that had recently been written, Raul Berger, some others at the time, and I found what I thought was the best summary the best treatise on what's an impeachable offense was the majority staff report of the House Judiciary Committee from February 1974, written primarily by Hillary Rodham before she became Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, it is still a very good summary. An impeachable offense is not necessarily a crime. You can have crimes that are not impeachable offenses. You can have impeachable offenses that are not crimes. You can obviously have, have deeds that are both. An impeachable offense is basically an abuse of power, an abuse of, of, of process, an abuse of power that is dangerous to the public interest, that is dangerous to liberty, that is dangerous to the separation of powers, that aggregandizes uh, power to the executive, uh, that distorts the structure and function of government and endangers liberty. That's the best uh, uh, summary, I think. And, and as you... You look and at let me just add one thing. There was, for example, an article of impeachment considered by the House Judiciary Committee against Richard Nixon. And it was that he had cheated on his income taxes to the tune of $560,000, which was more money those days than it is today. The committee voted it down because they said it's not an abuse of presidential power. It's a crime, but you don't have to be president to cheat on your income taxes. And wasn't that part of the 1998 debate, which was perjury was and is a crime, and one of the allegations about Bill Clinton was that he, was, he lied under oath, but given the subject matter, it wasn't or shouldn't have been an impeachable offense. Well, that was certainly my feeling at the time, and yes, he, he had committed perjury, and I hope this has a better ring to it. Um, he had committed perjury. One could debate uh, the circumstances that led to that, but the fact is he had committed perjury about a private sexual affair, not about anything that's threatened liberty or threatened the functioning of government in any way. And so a lot of people felt, I certainly felt, that wasn't a, an impeachable offense because it had nothing to do with an abuse of presidential power or threatened the structure or functioning of government or, 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 or transgressed on, on liberty. Now, you could say that the Ukraine matter is almost the mirror image of that in that it is not at all clear that a criminal offense took place, but the issue is whether the president abused his power in terms of his uh, interactions with the president of Ukraine and the whole relationship between the United States and Ukraine. Well, I think that's correct. Now, you could say that there was a violation of law there. There were several violations of law that may have occurred. But such, such that, as what? Like what, what violations the law could have? Well, figured? it's a violation of law to solicit, to accept or solicit anything of value for a campaign from a, a foreign national. And the question is, is, is dirty information on an opponent a thing of value? I would say yes. Some people might say it's inherently not, uh, uh, it's not valueless, but you can't measure it, so maybe it doesn't meet the test. But um, be that as it may, um, that's not the question. The question is, was there an abuse of presidential power um, not, for national, not for valid national goals? Now, now, valid national goals, by the way, 
I may think it's a valid national goal, you may not, in, on a political difference, but a national goal as opposed to a personal political goal. And, and do you have an opinion on that? I do, but I don't want to speculate today on, 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 on these things right now uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, w one of the things I remember from the 98 hearings, um, it was, I mean, th this was a great cast of characters, if, if you remember. I mean, this was, uh, you know, Henry Hyde was the chairman, John Conyers was the senior Democrat. You had uh, Chuck Schumer, Barney Frank, Jerry Nadler, Maxine Waters on the Democratic side. Although Chuck had been elected to the Senate, this was a post-election session, and he was a senator-elect. So he was both going to vote on the impeachment in the House and then vote as a juror on the impeachment in the Senate. That, that, life was good if you were Chuck Schumer <laughs> in those days. Uh, and on the Republican side, you had Lindsey Graham, you had Bob Barr, you had Bob Inglis, you had a lot of you know, really, really colorful people. And what I remember you saying, you personally and you Democrats, was that this was partisan. That was the word you kept hearing over again. This was just a partisan attempt to get the president. Well, look at the vote in the House last week on the impeachment inquiry. Almost entirely partisan, par along partisan lines. Are you vulnerable to the same criticism you were giving the, the Republicans in 1998? Politically, we may be vulnerable. Realistically, I think there's a real difference. What I meant when I said that at the time, I can't speak for anyone else, was that it was partisanly motivated. Um, not that it was only one side going to vote on it, although I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, this impeachment, this whole question, is not partisanly motivated. Indeed, the Democrats, certainly the Speaker, were very reluctant to get into it. Um, if, it is, if the votes are, uh, turn out to be along party lines, I would say that's more a comment on the, on the character of the modern Republican Party, which has changed significantly uh, in the last 20 years, it's a much more top-down led party, much more dominated centrally party. But um, it would be, if it's a partisan vote, it's, it's for partisan reasons, not because it, the impeachment is, is motivated by partisan reasons, which it was 20 years ago. Uh, how do you know? How do I know that well, ha, ha, I mean, years ago Well, why is that? I mean, I, I, to an outside observer, you could just say there was six of one, half a dozen of the other. An outside they observer the would have to look at the justifications. As, as Nancy Pelosi says, she actually quotes Abraham Lincoln as saying, without public sentiment, you can do nothing. With public sentiment, you can do anything. And the fact is, if there's going to be an impeachment, it will not succeed without approval of the majority of the American people. Uh, heavy majority of the American people because you need a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Uh, and regardless of partisan lineups, um, you will need a heavy majority of the American people to succeed, and that won't be partisan because uh, the American people are not divided two-thirds, one-third. Is it worth it to proceed with impeachment if you realistically can expect getting two-thirds in the Senate? Yes, it is worth it under some circumstances. The purpose of impeachment, uh, there's, there are any number of purposes for an impeachment, one of which is to vindicate the Constitution and to vindicate the rule of law um, and to prevent normalizing uh, uh, destructive, destructive to, the, to, to, the, to a democratic society conduct. Um, and regardless of whether you, I mean, obviously, if you think a president has, has engaged in totally lawless uh, uh, attacks on the rule of law, if he's engaged in, in aggrandizement of power and, and all the other impeachable offenses, then yes, he, you think he should be impeached and removed. But whether he is or not, uh, if you think that all of that has happened, you've got to show there's a penalty. You cannot allow that kind of conduct to be normalized so the next president or the president after him or her thinks it's okay to do it or you get used to it and the public gets inured to it. If, if an impeachment passes the House and fails to muster two-thirds in the Senate, is that a failure? It would depend on what the vote in the Senate is, what the perception of the vote in the Senate is. If the perception is uh, the House should never have impeached the, uh, the, the, 
the, the evidence was flimsy, and of course the Senate did what it should have been, then obviously it's a failure. If the perception is there were ample grounds for impeachment, the House did what it should have done, and the Senate acted uh, contrary to defense of the Constitution, contrary to defense of the rule of law, in, in purely out of partisan uh, spirit or purely out of partisan fear, then that would, that would be different. You, you say the perception is whose perception? The people, the American people. In my experience, they disagree about a lot. They disagree, but you get obviously you're not yeah. going to get an, uh, <laughs> you're not going to get a, a unanimous or near unanimous opinion, but you can get a dominant opinion, and you can take lessons. And the real question is, has the has the situation changed in such a way that you're not going to have a repeat of that kind of conduct? Um. You, you have been in Congress um, through several different presidencies, uh, including several different Republican presidencies. Uh, do you think the Republican part, uh, you, you made a brief allusion to this, uh, how do you think the Republican Party has changed during, during your tenure as a, as a member of Congress? Well, both parties have changed in one respect, and that is that uh, the Democratic Party no longer has a large conservative element, the Republican Party no longer has a fairly large, moderate to liberal element. Did it, when, uh, you, when you arrived yes, in the mid-90s? When I arrived, I didn't perceive it that way. I thought the Republicans were very conservative. But the political science uh, uh, literature at the time and the National Journal vote reviews at the time showed that there was about a 30% overlap. That is to say, the 30% of the Republicans in the, in the House, maybe the Senate too, I don't remember, but certainly in the House, were more liberal than 30% of the Democrats Wow. And 30% of the Democrats are more conservative than the 30% of the, of, of, of the Republicans. Remember, we had a large, I came in in 92, 94 things really changed. We had a large Dixiecrat contingent. It's still part of the Democratic Party. We, we still had, a, I don't know, 50, 60 members from the, from the Solid South. That changed. Um, today, you look at the National Journal vote ratings, there is no overlap whatsoever, and there's a 40-degree divide between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrats. There's just nothing in between. So in that, both parties have become, and some people used to think, I remember I thought, I'm not so sure I was right, I thought it would be desirable if the parties became ideologically uh, uh, coherent. I'm not so sure it was a good result, but it happened. Okay, and it happened in both parties. The Republican Party, and I think uh, Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann have written a lot about this, has become less a political party, less a democratic with a small d political party than, a, than an institution that is uh, um, very willing to uh, traduce norms, very willing to uh, uh, evade the normal limits on, on the exercise of power and very oriented towards certain goals no matter what the procedures. And that's very dangerous. Um, and, what, and how has the Democratic Party changed? The Democratic Party got more ideologically liberal on balance, but uh, hasn't changed its character that much um, in the sense that it hasn't, it hasn't shown the same anti-democratic procedural willingness that the Republicans have. And, and how do you account for the rise of Donald Trump? Because you, um, I mean, you, you, I, having written about you and talked about, why don't you talk a little bit about your history with Donald Trump and, and go, go back to, uh, you know, the, you know the, there are people here I know from uh, the west side of Manhattan and, and, you know, Jerry represents the west side and you, you did in the assembly. Talk about Television City. <clears throat> well, there isn't that much to say about it. It was... Well, it wasn't uh, built, in 1985, thank goodness, yeah. In 1985, uh, Donald Trump bought the property along the river from 59th to 74th Street, uh, from 59th to 72nd Street. He bought it, by the way, from Lincoln West Associates, which was interesting. Lincoln West Associates had had a project which we had opposed, which had failed. It had been approved, but failed financially. And Lincoln West Associates was owned 35% by a fellow named Abe Hirschfeld, who some of you may remember as a nut. And... <laughs> 65% was owned by the Macri interest, namely the father of the current president of Argentina. Oh. Um, and they had this project and it didn't fly and they sold the land to, to uh, Donald Trump. And um, I had a particular interest in that land. It was a rail yard. And I wanted to revive rail, trans rail freight transportation there because at that time in Manhattan we still had 
in New York City, half a million manufacturing jobs, a quarter of a million manufacturing jobs in Manhattan below 59th Street, depending on rail transportation. And they were stopping the service. And I remember bumping into Trump at a community board meeting, and I said to him, I said, I don't know what you're gonna plan, you know, what you're gonna propose there. I don't know if I'm gonna support it or oppose it, but I'm not gonna kill myself unless you design it in such a way as to preclude the possibility of continued rail freight service underneath it. If you do, I will do everything I can in my power to kill your project, whatever it is. He proposed exactly that, and I spent the next 20 years <laughs> doing everything I could, among, uh, it wasn't the only thing I was doing in 20 years, but doing everything I could to kill his project. Now, when he proposed his project, it was 14 and a half thousand units of housing, uh, 150 story building in the middle. The television seven, city, yeah. Seven, seven buildings on either side of it, that looked small, but each was bigger than the Chrysler building. They looked small compared to the 150 stories. And some television studios between 59th and 61st Streets. Everybody, every local legislator, every community group opposed it for a number of years. And in 1991, a so-called compromise was reached. And most of the community groups, well, most of the overarching community groups, like the Central Park Conservative, the Municipal Arts Society, not the local people. Um, and, and most of the legislators bought into this compromise. I continued to oppose it, and I opposed it bitterly. And in 1990, it was approved, unfortunately. I think it was the last thing the Board of Estimate did before it went out of existence. But I continued opposing it on various grounds. In 1998, I got Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Andrew Cuomo, to revoke the mortgage guarantee that they were gonna get which cost them I don't know how many millions of dollars, and I opposed it for a number of other things, and unfortunately it got built. Um, and that was, that was our, that was our but, relationship. But what were, your, what were your interactions with him like, with Trump? I only had three interactions with him over all those years. One was that conversation I told you I had at the community board. One was shortly thereafter, a few months later, when he proposed his, uh, his, his, his proposal, and as a courtesy, he called in all the local legislators, the, uh, the, the several assembly members, the council member, the congressman, uh, one by one, individually, to show us the proposal. And I remember seeing the proposal. I went up to his office in Trump Tower, and he unveiled, he had a model, and he showed me the proposal, and I thought it was grotesque. But he looks at me and he says, so what do you think? I wasn't gonna say it's grotesque. So I'm trying to think of something to say. So I said, well, that 150-story tower is that gonna be uh, commercial or residential? Not that I cared, but it was something to say. I said, is that gonna be commercial or residential? He says, I don't know about the first 40 stories, but above the 40th story, it'll be uh, residential. This piqued my interest. I said, really? What's the highest people live in the United States now? And he said, oh, Sears Tower in Chicago, 110 stories. Interesting. And then he starts getting excited. And he said, do you know that the people on the top stories at Sears Tower, before they go out in the morning, they call the concierge and ask what the weather is because they're above the clouds and they can't see it. I'm thinking, what a drag, but he's getting excited about this. <laughs> and so I looked at him and I said, what's the highest people live in New York? He said, oh, 68th floor, Trump Towers. And I live on the 68th floor. And then it dawned on me, I said, and I suppose you'll live on the 150th floor here. He said, yes. And I thought to myself, but didn't say, so okay, this is all about your wanting to be the highest man in the world. My third and only other interaction with him on that, actually there was, there was one more after that, only other interaction with him was um, um, in 1992, I think it was, he had some proposal that he wanted to make, I don't remember what it was, in Lower Manhattan, and near the Brooklyn Bridge. And he said to an old line, District, Democratic district leader named Jimmy McManus, who knew everybody. He said, I'd like to talk to Jerry about this, but I'm sure he, he hates me, he, he, he wouldn't meet with me. So Jimmy said, no, he's reasonable, he'll meet with you. So we met for breakfast, and he outlined it to me, and I looked at him, I said, mm, sounds okay. And that was the end of that, I never heard about it again. But I surprised him by not automatically opposing it, because I wasn't opposed to him, I was opposed to the project. And I don't remember what that project was, but it, the last interaction I had with him was in, in 2017, um, when there was a meeting in the White House, November of 2017, 
And I went there because Governor Cuomo insisted I go to that meeting. And the meeting consisted of Governor Cuomo and Governor Christie of New Jersey, three of the four senators, uh, Gillibrand, Schumer, Booker, but not Menendez, who was on trial at the time, um, and a half a dozen Congress members from each state, bipartisan. And the subject of the meeting was the Gateway Project. We wanted to get you know, money for Gateway. The Obama administration had agreed to pay half the $14 billion cost. The Port Authority and the two states were going to put up $14 billion. Obviously, an absolutely crucial project. And so the governors, Governor Cuomo, very much wanted this meeting. And OK. So we walk in. There are place guards. We sit down. The governor, this, everybody I just mentioned. Then the president walks in with the Secretary of Transportation and, and Chief of Staff. And he looks around, and he sees Carolyn uh, Maloney from the east side. And he says, good to see you, Carolyn. Remember, I was one of your first supporters. Now, when she ran for the city council in 1982, he may very well have given her a campaign contribution. OK. Then he sees me. He says, good to see you, Jerry. I remember when we worked together on the West Side Project. <laughs> yeah, I suppose we worked on the West Side Project at the same time on different sides. But OK, we worked together. And then he looks around, and he says, uh, and he gives a big hello to Senator Schumer, a big hello to Senator Gillibrand, a big hello to Senator Booker, and asks innocently, where's Senator Menendez? And Christie looks down, and he says, uh, he's busy. <laughs> and then we talked about the project. Um, how did Donald Trump get elected president? He got elected, I think, because he tapped into uh, a vein of cynicism and, um, well, two things. One, cynicism and unhappiness at the state of the economy, by which I do not mean how the economy was doing, on, you know, GDP and so forth. But the fact is that people saw and see now that, that uh, the economy may be going okay, but all the money's going to the top. Average wages haven't increased in 30 years. It's the first generation in American history where kid, people don't see their kids doing better than they did or don't expect that. So a lot of very great frustration. He also tapped into uh, a lot of racism and xenophobia. But I, it, it, it's interesting because it showed he and I like to contrast him and Bernie and Bernie Sanders. What what happened in that campaign? Bernie Sanders and it's a left wing and a right wing populism, and there's a there's there's an appetite for that. Bernie Sanders comes along and he says, uh, you have real problems, A, B, and C. And here are the solutions, D, E, and F. And some people agree and some people don't agree. Trump comes along and says, you have real problems, A, B, and C. And they're the fault of the Mexicans or the Chinese or whoever the current uh, escape, escape, scapegoat is. And the solution is me. I'm the solution. Only I am bright enough and brilliant enough and look at my history as a, you know, and, on, on The Apprentice and, and The Art of the Deal to, to take care of these problems where everyone else either didn't care because they at least don't care about you or they were too stupid to know how to do it. I'm the only bright one. Standard fascist appeal, Fuhrer, complete with the Fuhrer Princip. Um, and there's a, real, there's a real appetite for that. And there's still a real appetite for that. And there's a real appetite, by the same token, for the left-wing populism. People are not happy. And when they're not happy, they're looking for solutions. Are, are you a left-wing populist? Yeah, in many ways. Really? I mean, you, you identify with Bernie's uh, appeal? With a lot of it. I'm, I'm not a socialist, although I was a member of DSA years ago. But I, 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 but I do certainly think that... Um, one of the major problems, yes, if by populist you mean someone who thinks that much too much of the wealth of society is going to the very top, yes. If you mean someone who thinks that we have to get better control over power, yes. Now, much of American, originally when the, when the country was founded, uh, the f generation of the founders and the people before that and, and the generation after that, Locke and so forth, not Locke, um, John Stuart Mill and so forth, said you have to limit power. The power they envisioned that had to be limited was government power. They did not envision corporations and corporate power um, to the that, that we have developed it. And 
you can approach corporate power, which can overwhelm democracy and has, you can approach it in several ways. You can ignore it, obviously. You can, uh, you can say, as a socialist does, we're going to take it over. The government's going to run all the means of production, which I don't agree with. Or you can have uh, uh, a combination of strong government, of a strong inf antitrust enforcement, which we haven't done in 40 years, but which our, our committee is starting to do now um, uh, for the first time since 1976. Um, strong antitrust enforcement, break up a lot of the very big uh, companies, plus very strong government regulation, plus countervailing power, which usually comes from labor unions. And you've got to en encourage that. Because power is going to exist, and the question is, do you have untrammeled corporate power, untrammeled money power, or do you seek to limit it and control it and spread it around by countervailing power? The countervailing power can be labor unions, can be government, uh, but there's got to be co countervailing power to large corporate power. You, you, you were, I mean, as I said, you were in Congress during, um, you know, several presidencies, including George W. Bush, who was a very conservative Republican. How would you contrast the George W. Bush presidency and the Donald Trump presidency? Well, they were very different. I was chairman of the, in 19, uh, 19, in 2007 and 8, I was chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee Subcommittee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties of the Judiciary Committee. And I came under a great deal of pressure to hold impeachment hearings on George Bush. In fact, I was threatened with a primary fight if I didn't, but I refused. I said, no, he hasn't done anything that is so clearly impeachable um, that, is, uh, th that it's worth putting the country through that trauma. And so I wouldn't do it. He was a very, George Bush was a very conservative, he's still, I shouldn't talk about him in the past tense, he's still alive, but as a president, he was a very conservative figure, conservative economically, uh, conservative in terms of uh, 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 socially, willing to use demagogic issues. Remember the 2004 elections, uh, get the vote out by uh, putting anti-gay marriage amendments on the ballot. He had no scruples with that. But he didn't pose a real threat to the rule of law. He didn't violate democratic norms. Um, he didn't aggrandize power. He didn't, for example, one of the problems we have now um, is the ability, and he didn't lie a million times a day um, so that you can't believe a thing. And he didn't attack the press. He didn't attack the press as fake news, and he didn't attack the judiciary. He didn't attack the institutions of American democracy, which we, some of which are government, some of which are not, which we rely on to protect liberty and to diffuse power. What's wrong with attacking the press? I, I mean, that's It's seriously. one thing to attack the press in the sense of saying that article is inaccurate, uh, uh, you didn't see my virtues in that article, whatever, that's, that's fine. But attacking the press as an institution, trying to say you cannot believe the press, you can only believe my propaganda, um, it's all fake news. You destroy the, the, you try to destroy the ability of any information. The, the, any dictatorial regime does this. The, the, the an analog to fake news was the, was the Nazi Lugan press, the lying press. You cannot believe the press, so just take the information from what the Minister Goebbels tells you, or from what uh, Breitbart tells you. Um, do, do you, I mean, just before we, I mean, do you think, I mean, th there are some people who think when you start talking about Goebbels and Nazis, you're you're, you're, you're overstating the case in, in making a comparison to anything regarding usually that Usually that is true. And certainly I'm not talking about the Holocaust or anything like that. But in the tactic, this specific tactic was a very deliberate tactic by the Nazis, by the Nazi party in Weimar, Germany. Um, and it's being used again. It's a very specific tactic and it was used by other dictators. You, you attack the press, you attack the judiciary, you attack any institution that you can't control. Um, you, send, you try to centralize power. And we depend not only on government institutions and, and um, 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 separation of powers, which they're also attacking, um, but we depend on, we, we call the press the fourth estate because it's, it, we depend on it as part of our, of our system for, 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 for information and for, and for democratic rule. Now, one thing, for example, I started to say, Congress, whether it's controlled by the same party as the president or not, always is supposed to be a check and a balance. It's supposed to hold the administration accountable. 
Obviously, it's going to be more hostile to, to, to the other parties present than to your own party, but even so. And one of the f ways that Congress functions is by getting information. A congressman or a committee chairman or a congresswoman or whoever writes a letter or asks information from the Department of Whatchamacallit. Jeff Sessions, as Attorney General, actually wrote a letter to all agency heads saying, do not reply to any request for information from Congress unless it comes from a committee chairman. In other words, from no Democrats, because the Republicans were in control then, and only committee chairman. And the administration since then, they don't even respond to subpoena for information now. So you cut off information, um, you, you, you defy subpoenas, you cut off information to Congress or to the press for that matter, with, with no daily briefings and so forth, and that's, that's a total, it, it, it's, it, it, it's a means of controlling information and, 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 and denying a democratic society the information it needs to function. Pat Cipollone, who, Cipollone, who's now the White House counsel, wrote an eight-page single-space letter a couple of weeks ago saying that there would be no cooperation with the impeachment investigation at all. No witnesses, n no documents. Some administration officials have defied that, but some have not, including apparently four today, have refused to testify. Is the, is, is that an impeachable offense, the, the president's defiance of congressional oversight? Well, I'm not going to speculate about impeachment, but I will note that Article 3, I think it was, of the Nixon impeachment, uh, Article 3 of the Nixon impeachment articles was precisely that, was defiance of congressional subpoenas. And it's, uh, and by the way, it's not just defiance, and, and it, this isn't new from Pat Sip alone. When the Judiciary Committee was having hearings and, and on, on the Mueller report, um, we had any number of, of witnesses who refused subpoenas, who simply disobeyed subpoenas, wouldn't show up, or having shown up, refused to testify. Um, Hope Hicks, for example, I'll use two examples. She, she appeared under instructions from the White House not to talk about anything that occurred while she, while she was in the White House. She, so we could ask her questions, they said, about her activities prior to that. She was asked, uh, where, where in the White House was your desk? White House counsel leaned forward and said, objection. You may not answer the question. I asked her a question, just to show how ridiculous it was. While you were in the White House, was there a major war between Israel and Egypt? Which everybody knew there was no major war between Israel and Egypt. White House counsel leaned forward and says, objection. You may not answer the question. Complete defiance. Um, and it's not just a question of of defiance of Congress, that is trying to make the inability of Congress or of other institutions to hold the executive in check. We are winning, now they, 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 um, they the administration, has come up with ridiculous arguments. Now there are legitimate privileges. But I would point out even in the days of really um, 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 abusive congressional committees, Joe McCarthy, House on American Activities Committee, if someone was subpoenaed, they showed up. Then they might refuse to answer the, the question on the grounds that might tend to incriminate me, Fifth Amendment privilege, whatever, and you could adjudicate that. Now you have a situation where people simply refuse to show up, where the, where they claim, where the president claims absolute immunity. There's absolute immunity to testify to Congress about anything regarding the administration. Well, that is a claim of executive, that's a claim of monarchical right. Now we're winning, we will win those lawsuits. We, we've sued for that, we'll win those lawsuits, but uh, it takes a long time and we're gonna have to figure out a better way of enforcing congressional subpoenas. Well, the, the, well what it, like, so what's a better way than going to court? Well, there are three traditional ways of enforcing a congressional subpoena. The one that's been used for the last 80 years normally is you vote a contempt, if someone doesn't show up or doesn't answer the questions, you vote a contempt citation. You give the contempt citation to the U.S. attorney and they prosecute criminally. Well, the U.S. attorney works for Bill Barr <laughs> and they're not gonna do this. The second way which we're using is you take the contempt citation and the House and the person of the House General Counsel sues for civil enforcement. 
that will work. The problem is it takes a long time. Even when you're doing a, an expedited proceeding, it takes months and months, which can destroy the, the purpose. The third way hasn't been used since 1934 and probably would take us eight to ten months of litigation to use it again and, and needs some uh, uh, updating to make it usable, but we're going to, uh, I think we should do it and I think we're going to do it, and that is called inherent contempt. Under inherent contempt, um, you conduct a trial in the bar of the house. You import a judge. What's the bar of the house? Is that like a saloon? What is it? Oh, okay. Right. House floor. You can conduct a trial in the house floor, and one of the problems is that means that no other business is getting done. You find, you find the fellow guilty by vote. You vote he's guilty of contempt. You send the uh, sergeant at arms to arrest him. You put him in the house jail, which was demolished to make way for the Supreme Court building in 1934. And he stays in jail till he agrees to testify or, or deliver the documents or whatever. Now the problem with that, the problem with that is that number one, it hasn't been used in eight, in, in, since 1934. And our, 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 our notions of due process and habeas corpus have advanced since then. If we tried to use it now, our lawyers tell us it would probably take eight to 10 months to make it usable. Uh, which would take it out of the realm of anything we're, we're dealing with right now, number one. And number two, when we're in court on civil enforcement of subpoenas, a judge is reluctant, if he can avoid it, to judge between two branches of government, the executive and the legislative. And if we started using inherent contempt, we run the risk of the judge saying, oh, you can use inherent contempt. You don't need me. Case dismissed. And we'd have to start from, 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 from scratch. The other problem is, you can't really tie up the house for everyone you want to do. So we're going to, I'm going to propose that we have new rules, that we give it to a subcommittee, that we have monetary fines, $10,000 the first day, 20 the second, 40 the third, and so forth, rather than just incarceration, that we modernize it and make it usable, but it won't be in time for this impeachment consideration. Let me ask you a, a sort of political question about impeachment before we go to some questions from the audience. Um, there, there are a couple schools of thought that do a narrowly focused, Ukraine-focused impeachment or one based on Ukraine, obstruction of justice as outlined by Mueller, obstruction of Congress as you just described. Compare the merits of those two approaches. Um, I don't think there's that big a difference, actually. There's a big difference between one article of impeachment and 12. Between one and three, I don't know that there's, there's that big a difference. I'm not gonna speculate on what we're gonna do, but uh, let me say I think there's a lot of evidence for all three of those you mentioned and for a lot of others. Um, if, I mean, as you know, the Intelligence Committee, as you mentioned earlier, is gonna hold these fact-finding hearings about Ukraine. If you proceed with uh, other grounds for impeachment, let's say obstruction of Congress, obstruction of justice. Do you have to call other witnesses to the, to the Judiciary Committee? Well, if we were to do articles of impeachment other than that one, on, on that one, the Ukraine, the, the, well, here's the procedure. The Intel Committee is going to write a report to the, to, the, to the Judiciary Committee. We may get reports from other committees. I'm not expecting any, but it's conceivable that some other committee comes up with something else and writes a report to us on, on some other proposed article of impeachment. Um, we would have to consider that article of impeachment. If we wanted to do other articles of impeachment, if we wanted to, um, depending on the nature, we might have to hold a hearing. Uh, we might not. We certainly, for any article of impeachment we were considering, whether, it's the, whether it comes from intel or whether judiciary initiates it, we will certainly have to have due process. We'll have to have, uh, by a hearing, I don't, I, I said I'm not sure we'd have to have a hearing with, with, with new witnesses, but you might. But certainly we'd have to have a hearing in which the president's, in which the minority council and the majority council could make statements, uh, uh, make proposals, in which the president's council could do the same, could defend the president, et cetera. Whether you'd need fact witnesses, is, I don't know. That's a different question. But, but I mean, so, so conceivably you could do impeachment um, following the Intelligence Committee hearings 
without calling more fact witnesses, without calling, say, Don McGahn, the former White House counselor, you, you could do it through submission of briefs and paper and... and you could. Remember, do you think that's a good idea? I'm not going to get into that now, <laughs> and it depends on what. But let me just say, remember, the, in, the, um, in, in, in the Clinton impeachment, Judiciary Committee called no fact witnesses. It was done completely off the Star report. Right. Um, Star testified. Star testified about his report. Right. But there were no fact witnesses. Star did not say, I observed this or that. He was not a, a fact witness. Do, do you think, in retrospect, um, the Judiciary Committee hearings on Clinton's impeachment were a good structure? Were they fair? Yes, I think they were fair, basically. Uh, the whole thing was unfair, but the structure of the hearing is, was fair. The whole thing was unfair because it was based on something that wasn't impe an impeachable offense. But structurally, yeah, I think they were fair. Um, there's a microphone in the center. Um, anybody want to line up and ask? Why don't you just walk up and please, I guess, give your name, but get, ask a question. Please don't give a speech. Um, I have two big questions. I'm Howard Silver, class of 69. <laughs> Uh, one of Stanley's last students. Um, in your view, what would it take to get the Republicans to get off their current status and turn on Trump? And my second question is, how did the Democrats win the 2020 election? How do, what? How do we do in the election? No, how, how, well, that would be like to know, but it was, it's how, how, will, how do the Democrats win in 2020? All right, well, on the first question, I think that... Uh, Republican senators will vote to uh, remove the president when they think the penalty for not doing so in a general election is more dangerous than the penalty for doing so in a Republican primary. It's a very straight utilitarian calculation. Um, and what might, what might shift that current balance? Because I think as uh, the implication is at the moment, it, the, the risk what of a primary shift, is what, worse. What may or may not shift that is are the public hearings that are, uh, and the public that's going to that's going to occur? Remember, in the Nixon case, it was very sharply tilted against impeachment. Uh, in fact, I remember, I remember, I wasn't there, but we all remember that um, when the Judiciary Committee actually voted, there were eleven Republicans voted no and six Republicans voted yes. A day or two later. The so-called smoking gun tape came. The U.S. Supreme Court decided the tapes case. A day after that, the smoking gun tape came out. Immediately, within 24 hours of that, all the Republicans on the committee who'd voted no said, gee, if I had known, I would have voted yes. And 24 hours or 48 hours after that, Goldwater and Hugh Scott and Rhodes went to, went to Nixon said the jig is up, and he, re and he resigned. I, I, think the, I think the Supreme Court decision was August 2nd. He resigned August 9th. It, it, it switched very quickly. And I'm not saying there'll be such an, a huge, such a quick switch, but when these people testify and dramatize what, what we're seeing and are subject to cross-examination, that'll determine how, they, uh, how the public views this. Next question. Next question. Uh, Ralph Blumenthal, class of 63. Um, I'd like you to put on your political strategist hat uh, for a moment. Uh, assuming Trump is not removed from office and runs in the election, um, how dangerous do you think it is for the Democrats to choose a vulnerable candidate? What, what should the Democrats do to choose the best possible candidate against Trump who could win? And uh, how do you assess the risks at this point of picking the wrong candidate? Well, the risks of picking the wrong candidate are always very great, obviously. Um, the question is, how do you figure out who the wrong candidate and the right candidate is? <laughs> um, I don't know. It depends on your reading of the electorate to a large extent. I mean, there are really two narratives. The narrative you hear most often is, um, you got to go to the center. You got X number of votes on the right, forget them, X number of votes on the left, they're ours, they're the Democratic votes. And you've got you to get enough votes in the center, so nominate a more centrist candidate. That's one way of looking at it. Sometimes it works. Another way of looking at it is what I said before. There's a populist hunger in the country. Um, Trump 
we know that Trump motivated huge Democratic turnout, minority turnout, women turnout. Uh, last year, we'll see tomorrow what happens. I suspect it'll be the same in Virginia and a few other places. Um, and a good, solid populist candidate like an Elizabeth Warren uh, could, could really tap into that, and maybe she's the strongest candidate. Or th That's a different way of looking at it. I can't say which is correct. I can say one thing, uh, putting on a political strategy hat. Um, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders both support Medicare for All, which, is, which I've always supported. I've, I've co-sponsored that bill since every year I've been in Congress. From a political point of view, there are two problems with it. One, how do you pay for it? It's going to cost trillions, billions, quazillions. She answered that. And I think her answer politically was a good answer. Uh, it'll be subject to criticism, but basically it'll be okay. Basically we'll, we'll take some of the money we're already spending and we'll tax the, the, the trillionaires and everybody will be happy. Okay, but the second question is a, a more difficult question. And, and, and she's gonna have to come up with a good answer. I don't know what that answer is. So if she comes up with a good answer, she can be a very, very strong candidate. If she doesn't, I'm not sure she can. And that is, okay, 150 million Americans have health insurance. Some of them don't like the health insurance, but a lot do. A lot of people like the health insurance until they find out that when they get something real, it doesn't matter, but by then it's too late. It doesn't help. So they have the health insurance. Now you're gonna to say to them, we're gonna take this health insurance away from you, but we're gonna give you something much better, trust us. Political history says people don't trust. They don't like that. In fact, I'll tell you one little anecdote. I mean, and we saw people lost in 2010 because they voted for Obamacare. Now people like Obamacare. There was a Democratic congressman from Minnesota for many years, or Wisconsin for many years, named David Obey, who was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And he retired about four or five years ago. And he was elected to Congress in 1969, in a special election, to replace the fellow who was named by Nixon as his first Secretary of Defense. And I once asked him, we were just chatting, and I once asked him, when was the last Democrat in your district before you? Remember, he was elected in 1969. He said, oh, Joe Blow, who lost in 1938. I said, why did Joe Blow lose in 1938? Oh, he lost because he voted to establish Social Security. Now, can you imagine anybody losing f to vote because he supported Social Security, but when it was a new thing? And we see in healthcare policy, people distrust whatever's new, any major change in policy. That is a, a caution signal on Elizabeth Warren's campaign. I hope she can overcome it, and maybe she can. Maybe she'll come up with a good answer to that. Um, but that's, but that's, that's at the moment. If it weren't for that, I'd say she's probably a very, very strong candidate, and maybe the strongest. But that, she has to surmount. Yes, sir. Leslie Freight Stern, class of 62. Not a political, but a personal question. There you were, a youngster on the west side, a reform Democrat, getting started in politics. Uh, uh, I was up in Washington, Washington Heights. Heights fighting the Zaretskys. Do you ever pinch yourself and say, how the hell did I ever get here? How is it that I'm quoted in the paper every day, on television every day? Are you ever mystified by it all? No. <laughs> um, I worked. I worked very hard to get elected to the various things I've been elected to. Right. I was lucky in some things. I mean, luck plays, plays a role. I won my first assembly race at a 16,000 by 73 votes. Whoa. You could just as easily have lost by 73 votes, and that was obviously this, either, the luck, either luck or God's finger pointed at you, whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, in Congress, uh, well, I made a choice in Congress, and the choice paid off. Um, in, in, in Congress, you can, I joined two committees when I was appointed, when I was elected. I got on the two committees I wanted. One was judiciary and one was transportation. And I stayed on those two committees. Now transportation is a very large committee, so is judiciary. A lot of people leave those committees for so-called higher committees, appropriations, uh, uh, ways and means, energy and commerce. And I could have done that half a dozen times. I elected not to do it. I, I really liked the issues, I, I, 
My original motivation in politics was civil liberties and civil rights. I liked the issues on, on and, and wanted to contribute on, on judiciary. And I could have been on those committees half a dozen times and chose not to. I could have run for you know, vice chairman of the caucus or tried to climb the leadership ladder. I chose not to. I chose to put my time and effort into the two committees and then, and get senior on them and get more influential on them. And then it was partially luck uh, in terms of seniority and becoming chairman. Now, I had a contested election for chairman of the committee, but I was a senior member and that had a large role in it. Um, it could have been that I wasn't the senior member and I wouldn't have become chairman, but I did choose to put my eggs in those two baskets and it worked. Okay. Next question. You mentioned countervailing powers. You mentioned monarchical government. And I'm wondering if you, if the Democrats, if Congress is contemplating what to do post at least the House's voting for impeachment. As a historian of uh, France, I know that Louis XIV, an absolute monarch, could not decide on his own any major issue of foreign policy or military policy. So is it not necessary to introduce constraints so that an American president of a republic cannot on his own, whether by tweet or telephone, make decisions of great import? The whole design of the Constitution is to do precisely that. Um, as we've seen uh, with the decision on the Kurds, for example, this president, uh, without knowledge, but that's a separate question, made a decision on his own, uh, regardless of any of his advisors, any of his uh, cabinet officers, anybody in Congress. Nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, almost nobody supported that decision, but he was able to make it and execute it, and that's a weakness. I will say this, we do need, and this whole crisis has shown that we need stronger laws to enforce what were norms. And we've learned. Such as, such as what? I'll come to that in a second. And we've learned that we need to change some laws. My hope is, and we're, we're compiling lists right now in my office of things that we'll have to change. Uh, my hope is that in 2021, God willing, we'll have a Democratic president. And God willing, we'll have a Democratic Senate. But even if you have a Republican Senate, it's still in everybody's interest to put limits on the president, such as uh, Congress passed back in 1976 and 1977 various pieces of emergency legislation intended for real emergencies. The president, and, and, and there was a provision in those laws that said that if the president proclaimed an emergency, Congress within, I think, 60 days or 30 days, I forget which, could undeclare it, legislative veto. In 1983, the, uh, the Supreme Court, in an unrelated case, declared the legislative veto unconstitutional. In 1985, Congress came up with the wrong solution. And they said, okay, Congress can get rid of the state of emergency by concurrent resolution. But that means the president can veto the resolution. You need a two-thirds vote in both houses instead of a majority vote in one house. So we have to fix, and so the president has misused that. We, the Congress, refused to vote funds for his wall along the Mexican border. He's t taking funds from the military appropriated for other purposes to use for that purpose, claiming emergency powers. I hope the courts will stop him from doing that. They have not yet. But we should certainly make clear that you can't do that. Now, on that one, not only is James Madison rolling in his grave because he was the author, the you know, limits on power and, and separation of powers, but so is Oliver Cromwell, who led the English Civil War in the 1640s to say Parliament, not the President, votes the appropriations. We took that over, and here you've got the President appropriating money that Congress refused to appropriate and destroying the power of the purse. So one thing we have to do um, is change the uh, emergency laws to say something like um, the emergency ceases to exist if Congress doesn't affirmatively, by majority vote in both houses, reaffirm it every 30 days. Next Something question. like that. There are, other, there are other protections 
that we have to build in. We're assembling lists of them. And to prevent a president from making a major policy decision by tweet or telephone. Let, let, let's get, just get next question. Hello, my name is Carlo Invernizia Setti. I'm an associate professor of political science here at City College. Thank you for coming here. It's an honor to have you. My question is about the political effects uh, of the launching the impeachment procedure in case it, the articles of impeachment are not approved by the Senate on the upcoming presidential election. The common sense view is that it should harm the prospects of the Republicans for winning that election, but a more cynical view might be that perhaps it might actually harm the Democrats if it firms up support, Republican support for Trump by confirming the narrative that the well, deep state is out together. And, and the president says, I was exonerated in the Senate. Right. That, that's a, look, look at how I won, I'm a winner. And well, so certainly one argument. Okay, just uh, let, let's okay. let him answer that. Yeah. Certainly one argument against the whole impeachment proceeding is that it will, will never go any place in the Senate. You won't get a two-thirds vote, and the president will just wave it around and say, I've been exonerated and use it for his campaign. Um, I think there are two answers to that. One is the politics aside, if the president does the kinds of things he's doing, you've got to vindicate the Constitution and everything I said before. But second of all, politically, it depends. It depends. If the case is really made and people understand it, and the senators don't vote for it, then maybe you just defeat a lot of Republican senators up for re-election. Um, because the, the, the public is not inert here. And, the, and people, if he tries to use a Senate exoneration, but that's uh, as an, the Senate vote as an exoneration, but it doesn't ring true to the public, it, it's, it's, it, it's not gonna fly. And I'll point out one other thing. The usual evidence for this is that the Clinton impeachment allegedly hurt the, hurt the Republicans. Well, I don't think that's true. They, the Republicans lost five seats in the House, zero seats in the Senate uh, in that election. Uh, remember that election was after the House Judiciary Committee voted for impeachment before the House did. House did it in lame duck session in December. But th they lost fewer seats than you might have thought they would. Um, or rather they gained five seats. They, 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 they did worse than was expected. On the other hand, it completely tarnished Clinton. It made it impossible for him to campaign for Gore in 2000. It made, uh, uh, it enabled Bush to campaign by saying he was gonna restore integrity and respect to the Oval Office. And the Republicans in 2000 gained the presidency, picked up the Senate and the House. So I don't think the impeachment hurt them. I think you can make a very good case that the failed impeachment uh, helped them. Next question, let's just, we're running out of time here, so yeah, I just wanna let everybody um, ask. Hi, I'm a, my name is Gabriel, I'm a junior here at City College. Um, we spoke a lot about impeachment, but you spoke briefly about corporate power, and I agree there's been about a- what? Corporate power and influence in, in politics. And I agree, I think there's been a, a, a war against the working class, so my question is, as chairman of House Judiciary Committee, would you support or introduce a constitutional amendment to overturn sorry, Citizens would I, United? Would I support what? A, a, a constitutional, constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United, claim that corporations are not people, and move to public funding of elections. And the second part of that question Well, let me is, answer that first. Would I support yeah. public funding of elections? Yes, I certainly have supported yeah. that for the last 30 years or so. Would I support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United? Yes, but the odds of that happening are very small, but yeah, I would support it. And the second quick question is, uh, money in politics has an effect on the media as well and what we see and the propaganda that they spit. So I wanna, I wanna see, um, obviously money out of politics and how the money, would you speak to how the money influenced what we see on mainstream media outlets? <sighs> well, that's a whole lecture in itself, but money certainly does impact politics. And I think Thomas Jefferson was right when he said that you cannot have, um, um, I forget exactly what his quote was, but he basically said something to the effect of you cannot have all the wealth in few hands and expect to have a democratic society. And that is certainly true, and that is why we have to have a much more robust antitrust policy and a very different taxation policy, um, because you cannot allow uh, inherited, very concentrated inherited wealth and expect a democratic society. Thank yes, you. Sir. Um, my, I'm Ron Goldbrenner, I graduated in 1962. 
And my question is why uh, both the Democrats and the media bringing a knife to a gunfight? Uh, before, uh, Jeff mentioned that um, uh, it was too polarizing to compare it to Nazis. And it was what? Too polarizing to compare some of the activities to Nazi uh, activities. And you uh, were talking about the split between Democrats and, and uh, right-wing Republicans. But what we've seen over the last 30 years is um, Republican scorched earth politics, extremists in the extreme, <clears throat> from religious so, fanatics so, to uh, fanatics. So what's, you, what's your so question? The question is, why isn't the response more of a level of the threat? Why aren't you indeed saying that these things are so serious as to raise Nazi Germany, et cetera? Why doesn't the press uh, condemn the fake news, the propaganda machine of Fox News? Why doesn't the, uh, one okay. of the Democrats okay. well, go well, after extremists? All, let, me, let me just separate okay. that question into two yeah. questions. Normally you shouldn't, the moment you mention Nazi Germany or Nazis, uh, reasoned discourse goes out the window and all you have left are epithets and you can't, you can't really talk about it. So that's, that's why you shouldn't mention it normally. Um, maybe in a very narrow context of something they did like the Lugan Press, and maybe I shouldn't even have said that. Um, secondly, um, I'm not sure how to answer your question. I don't think it's fair to say that we're bringing in, certainly the Republicans in recent years have had much more resources in the form of Fox News and their, and their, their whole thing around it. Um, and they've had uh, obviously huge funding advantages. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that we're bringing a, a knife to a gunfight. We're doing what we can do. Um, if, if there are other suggestions of things we can do that we aren't, I'd like, I'd like to hear them. I mean, they're about to impeach the guy, so it's like not nothing, I, I'm right? I'm referring I mean, to the rhetoric. Anyway, anyway I, I think we get, let, let's have another question. Uh, hello, Seamus Campbell, a staff member here. Uh, I preface this, and it will sound like a softball funny question, but I'm a bit of a rules nerd. Uh, so you mentioned that inherent contempt has not been used in about 80 years. However, since then, there has been a growth of sunshine laws, so would if inherent contempt would, uh, was used, would they apply, or to put it another way, would uh, house jail actually be live streamed on C-SPAN? Would the house jail be live streamed? I suspect, by the way, that if we revive this, it'll be more on a monetary uh, fine basis than an actual jail, because of the, not because you want to be soft, but because of a different consideration. If, uh, if we sought to put you in jail for refusing to testify, um, you would most certainly get rid of habeas corpus and they would then be litigated. And while it's litigated, you would not be testifying. And your lawyer would tell, and you'd probably get a stay of going to jail while that rid of habeas corpus was litigated. And your lawyer would tell you, you know, we can fight this out. And if at the end the court says you gotta testify or you go to jail, then you can testify. So you're not running a risk. On the other hand, if the law said that uh, you're, you're, you're running a $10,000 fine a day uh, until the court determines, until you testify, I don't know that your lawyer could assure you that if the court goes the wrong way and you have to testify, that you wouldn't still have to pay that trillion dollars. So, so the fine might have a much more coercive effect. Um, next question. <clears throat> my name is Richard Bernstein. I teach here along with my colleague Carlo Acetti. And I'd just like to ask you uh, two more philosophical questions. They'll be short, I promise. First, in the future, once this ordeal is over, shouldn't Congress perhaps sponsor the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the South African model to assess what's happened to our Constitution, to assess the damage that has been done over the past several years, and how we fix it. Second, there's another- Let me another answer that first. Pardon? Let me answer that first. Go ahead. Please. I don't know, I haven't thought about it, I don't know the implications, I can't answer that question at the, at the, oh, okay. off the top of my head. That's fine. <laughs> the second question I have is this, one of the lessons that the Trump administration unfortunately has taught us is 
that, and I just want you to comment on this, isn't it the case that no constitution, however well administered and however well framed, can survive if one major party is totally willing to risk breaking that document's rules? No, I disagree with that, and it had better not be true, because you do have one major party who's totally willing to break all the rules, um, and they have broken any number of rules, norms, laws, rules, and the strength of a constitutional system, the strength of a democratic system, is can we bring to bear uh, sufficient power t to, to defeat that? And that's, what and that's what impeachment is part of. We have to say to anybody, whether it's Senator McCarthy in 1954 or Donald Trump now, you can't get away with that, and we're going to overrule you. And we have to have the ability and the power to do that and if we don't have the ability and power, then we have to amend the system to give ourselves the ability and the power. I hope we have that power now. Do you That's trust true. the current Supreme Court to um, vindicate the rules, rule of law as you're discussing it? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I, sus I, I hope, you know, Nixon had two or three appointees on the court that ruled against him eight nothing. Uh, Trump has two appointees, but there are also some very, you know, there are others. Um, will Roberts, will some of the others be institutionalist enough to, vi to, to, uh, to say you can't justify subpoenas? The law is very clear. They would have to make a revolution in the law to allow the kind of untrammeled uh, uh, um, 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 defiance. They'd be really saying that we have a monarchical system. I would hope that wouldn't happen. I, think that won't happen, but can I guarantee it? No. I'll I'll just say two last things. One, I commend to you the example of Venezuela to research at your leisure. But two, I wish you and your colleagues the very best of luck. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more questions here. If we could just sort of run through them pretty quickly, because I think we need to wrap up. Um, so if you could ask a quick question, and Jerry, ask a, give a quick answer. OK, uh, good evening. My name is Randall Conway, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm a little younger than some of the people that have asked questions so far. You're not a member of the class of 62? Or is there, I th I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I know I have a couple gray hairs, but I'm not that old yet. Um, one of the problems that I perceive with young people these days is that uh, they don't necessarily trust the process. Um, if, uh, Professor Bernstein has a little video of a, of a comedian, you know, as Robert Mueller, you know, kind of uh, saying, oh, Trump's, you know, um, guilty and so on and so forth, and he should be impeached right now, yada, yada, yada. And to some extent, I feel as though that's the way that a lot of people, uh, or that's what, what people want to see, and if they are denied that, they're not going to uh, be very happy with the process. How do you placate people and tell them to trust the system? You seek to get the system to operate in a trustworthy manner. Um, we, if, if, I hope that people will see that what we do is fair and equitable and aimed at vindicating constitutional and, and other rights. Um, and if we don't succeed, I hope they will conclude that we have to strengthen the institutions and, and strengthen some of the laws that we have so that we can vindicate constitutional norms rather than saying, well, the whole thing is hopeless. Because what other choice is there? There is no choice other than to strengthen democratic institutions, enforcement mechanisms, so you can hold power accountable. You can't just give up. If you, well, you can, but if you just give up, then power will not be accountable and you get a, di a dictatorship. Okay, let's, let, let, last three Thank questions you. here. Last three questions. Hello, my name is Abigail, I'm a student can, can here. Can you come a little closer to the oh. microphone? Yeah. Okay, hi, I'm Abigail, I'm a student here. So. During Trump's administration, one thing that he appealed to people and linked people was on the basis of race. And one can argue that now the racial divide has gotten worse. So how can Democrats link people um, when this has gotten worse? And how do you combat that for the next election? Well, as I said before, I think much of Trump's appeal was a, a racial, racist appeal. Um, and not so well hidden at that. Um, you beat it by beating him, and then there are laws we can and should pass. 
uh, some of which have, have been reported that it have passed the House, like the Equality Act for LGBTQ rights. We, we should pass the Voting Rights Act. Uh, uh, we passed it in committee. We're going to pass it uh, on the floor to, to un overcome the Supreme Court decision in Shelby, ver Shelby County versus Holder to make, to make the Voting Rights Act more real and uh, enforceable. There are a number of things you can do, and we have to fight to do them. There's no, there's no ultimate answer. The fight is constant. And, and, and ongoing. This fight's been going on for, for a couple thousand years so far. Thank you. Hello, I'm an undergraduate student here. So you mentioned earlier that Bush has not threatened democracy or democratic principles, yet with the Iraq War, establishment of Guantanamo Bay, war on terror, et cetera, wouldn't you agree that the violation of due process to some threatens the democratic principles of all, or at least in theory? I'm sorry, would I agree that what? I, I think she's saying is, you know, wasn't Bush pretty bad too? Bush was pretty bad. Listen, uh, the Iraq war, which I voted against, was, uh, was terrible, it was wrong, but it wasn't the violation of, of, of the Constitution because Congress voted it. Well, specifically the, the violation the, of due process the, in Guantanamo Bay. I'm coming to that. Okay. Guantanamo Bay was a horrible and is a horrible violation not just of due process, but of all kinds of rights. Um, the Supreme Court had a couple of good decisions in Hamdi and Hamdan, uh, but we haven't enforced them. But, but they've had also some decisions that weren't good. I mean, I, I've led the fight for, for years to close Guantanamo Bay on the floor. Um, but it isn't just Guantanamo Bay. It's the idea of holding enemy, so-called enemy combatants uh, indefinitely, or not trying people, alleged terrorists, under American law. Um, what's his name, Sheik, uh, what's his name, the, the, the Sheik, what's his name from, from the 9-11? Uh, Abdul Rahman? No, not him, the other guy. <laughs> she, yeah, be that as it may, he's been in, in Guantanamo for 19 years, hasn't had a trial yet. We have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to figure out how to have a military commission. He should be brought to New York, put in front of a normal Article Three, a normal court, and tried. Um, they're, they're, these shortcuts around due process are wrong, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it is true that hard cases, hard cases make bad law. That's an old truism. And uh, we have paid a price in civil liberties, and that's the things we are fighting. But you're right. Next, last question. My name is Jacqueline, Professor Bernstein, student, and it's a two-part question. Let's say the GOP refuses to impeach him. What steps, other than, let's say, censorship, are you going to follow? And full disclosure, I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter, and Elizabeth Warren is my next pick if Sanders doesn't get it. And third question is, you just posted online the eight-page impeachment. What about giving it to the public? See how you're from CNN printing it out and letting them see online? Because a lot of the American the public don't you know. You mean the procedures? Yes. Procedures are public. Anybody can print it. You can go online and see it. But um, more so on television, like CNN. Well, that's, you not, know. Up to me. that's not up to me. <laughs> um, what was your, your, your first question was? Was when it comes to impeachment, let's say the GOP doesn't impeach. Right. Your next move can be censorship. Well, censure, not censorship. Censure. Um, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, why? If, I'll, I'll tell you why. I wouldn't agree with that. I think censure, I opposed 20 years ago, some Democrats wanted, rather than, rather than go through the impeachment of uh, Clinton, to censure Clinton. I think censure is a slap on the wrist and has no effect. Now, in 1828, when it was used to censure um, um, Andrew Jackson, or 1830, to censure Andrew Jackson, they took things more seriously. They fought duels. Today, no one would care, it would have no effect. Uh, whether we impeach, if we, don't, if we don't convict him and remove him from office, we gotta defeat him. And then, it's up to uh, other authorities, he should be prosecuted for crimes if there are crimes. He, he should, no president should be immune from prosecution. Um, unfortunately, the Justice Department has said that they won't prosecute a president while he's president. I think that's wrong, but. But that's but, not a but, law, but, that's just an idea. No, that, yeah, but it's the practice which we, but if the, if the Justice Department, I agree with you, if the Justice Department won't do it, though it cannot be done. But the point is, once he's no longer president, he's subject to, to, to 
prosecution if you can prove crimes. Um, and removal from office either by removal by the Senate or by defeating him in, in the election, and then prosecution for crimes if indicated are the proper ways to deal with it. And then we have to strengthen our laws in many other ways. I think censure is just frankly not worth it. Please join me in thanking City and Congressman Nadler. Um, just, just a quick word, if I might. I'm Andy Rich. I'm the dean of the Colin Powell School, and it's, it's my honor to, to close out the ceremony. So first, another big thanks to, to Jeff Tubin and to Congressman Nadler. Um, we're grateful for your candor, for your thoughtfulness, for your precision and your answers, and for your public service, both of you, um, and for making this conversation possible for us here at City College. Um, just two other quick thank yous, and then I want to invite everyone to please join us in the back of the Great Hall. We have a reception. Um, and the first is uh, Anita and Paul were kind enough at the beginning to thank President Boudreau, Didi Mozaleski, and me for putting this together. But the person who really put this together is Tiffany Burt. Um, and Tiffany's standing at the back right now, but this is her last week at City College. Um, and has, there she is uh, by the food. So Tiffany, thank you very much for making this event and so many events at the Colin Powell School so successful. Uh, the Colin Powell School is the Division of Social Sciences at City College. We're 4,000 of the 16,000 students at City College. Um, and our precursor was the Division of Social Sciences, which included the Political Science Department, as the Colin Powell School still does today, and included Professor Stanley Feingold. Um, and I, I want to thank not only Anita and Paul, but um, all of the students of Professor Feingold for making this a new and very important tradition of the Colin Powell School and of City College of New York. And I wonder if I might invite all the students of, of Professor Feingold to stand up, um, because I know there's a number of them that are here. And I just lastly want to invite, first off, thank our students. I said to President Boudreau, I leaned over to President Boudreau as we were getting questions and said, I love our students uh, because you asked some of the best questions. Um, and I want to invite our students, if you haven't yet found your Stanley Feingold here at City College, uh, look around. I've heard stories, I became a professor in the political science department teaching American politics in 2003 and for therefore 16 years have heard stories about Professor Feingold and there's no doubt in my mind that he was a one of a kind, um, but we still have an astonishingly strong faculty who are here to support our students and to care for them and to foster their professional development and their success. And so I encourage students who are hearing about this guy, Stanley Feingold, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore, to know that there are faculty here who want to do just what he did for all of these students uh, of his. Uh, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years ago. So thank you all very much. Again, thank you, Congressman Nadler. Jeff.